So and next we'll discuss a couple of consequences of continuity. Okay, when you look at a stochastic process in its most basic definition, it has a map into the space of functions like we discussed above. So from your probability space with the sigma algebra f into the space of all functions on T with the cylindrical sigma algebra A. Sometimes you have events of interest which may not actually be measurable in the cylind in cylindrical sigma algebra. So for example, if you ask something like the supremum of your process or absolute value of your process over T is less than or equal than 1. Right, then we actually have seen in the first chapter that events of this type will not be in the cylindrical sigma algebra when t is uncount uncountable. So this is not in A if t is uncountable. Okay, so it's not measurable and you cannot ask what is the probability of this event in general. Okay, but however, if your process is sample continuous, and moreover, the metric space is separable, then you can rewrite the above event in an equivalent form using only countably many indices t, right? By continuity of the process, if you take some dense uh, subset tj in your space t, then you can simply rewrite this as supremum of x tj over j, less than or equal than 1, right? So if we choose this tj to be a dense subset of t. Okay, and now this in this form, the event involves only countably many indices and this is in the cylindrical sigma algebra so it's measurable and you can calculate the probability of this event once you know finite dimensional uh, distributions. So we can formalize this observation here for continuous processes uh, as follows. So if you view, if your process is continuous you can view it as a random function instead of the space of all functions, right? You can now view it as a function into the space of continuous functions on your metric space T. And then you can, on the space of continuous function, you can also define some metric. So let's call it the infinity, so the choice of the metric, it, it depends on the situation. So sometimes when, for example, T is compact, let's say when we talk about a process, let's say on 0, 1, continuous function on 0, 1, it's natural to take the metric to be just the L infinity. If you have, for example, we'll talk about a convergence to a Brownian motion on um, zero infinity, then it's not natural to talk about uniform convergence on the whole half line. So you can instead take, take a metric which metrizes uniform convergence on compact. So in some situations you can take d infinity to be, in this particular case, to be for example this usual construction, the sum 2 to the minus n dn over 1 plus dn, where dn between two functions f and g is just the supremum on the interval 0n. Okay, but for the next statement you can, for example, choose d infinity to be just the sup norm no matter what your metric space is. Even if it's not a natural choice, you know, the statement will be uh, true for, for this choice. And the statement here is the formalization of the above intuition that once you have continuity, 
can really express many events or events of this type which will be in the Borel sigma algebra on the space of continuous functions simply by taking event in the cylindrical sigma algebra and intersecting with the space of continuous functions. Okay, so in other words, let B on the space of continuous functions right, be a Borel sigma algebra on the space of continuous function with the either submetric or uh, the symmetric that metrizes uniform convergence on, on compacts. So the space comes with its own Borel sigma algebra, so you can take events in this uh, Borel sigma algebra. And the following lemma says that this Borel sigma algebra is just the intersection of cylindrical sigma algebra with the space of continuous functions E D okay, when again I already mentioned this but we assume that the space is separable okay, and the proof of this is exactly what we did above so let's consider it in one direction. So the inclusion in this direction, if you take an epsilon ball in the sigma algebra on the space of continuous functions, let's take an epsilon ball of all functions in the space of continuous functions which are at the distance epsilon from some function, given function g. So it's an epsilon ball centered at g. Now these generate the Borel sigma algebra on the space of continuous functions with the sup norm, but we can also rewrite just like we did above, right? We can rewrite this ball by continuity, restricting ourselves to the countable dense set. So we can consider all continuous functions such that this holds right for all j where tj was again just like above the dense set in t. Okay, so by continuity these two sets are the same and now since this event involves only countably many coordinates Right, this will be in the cylindrical sigma algebra, and because we consider only continuous functions, you have to intersect it with the space of continuous functions. This just formalizes the observation we made above for a specific ball. Now, in the other direction, I'll leave this to the notes, but basically, you know, you, you just have to consider. The, this inclusion for the set in the cylindrical algebra. So if you consider a set in the cylindrical algebra, okay, then it should be obvious that when you intersect it with the set of continuous functions, you will be you will end up in the Borel sigma algebra on the space of continuous functions. And uh, since cylindrical sets generate cylindrical sigma algebra, that's that's all you need. Okay, so that proves uh, this lemma. Okay, so in particular, when we work with, let's say, a Brownian motion, and let's say in the situation when we are interested uh, in this process on only on the interval 0, 1, right? So we can view it as an element in the space of continuous functions on 0, 1 with the sup norm. So as an element of this metric space that comes with its own Borel sigma algebra. Okay, and then we can look at any event which is in this sigma algebra and let's say, you know, I'm kind of repeating an example we had above, but let's say you want to ask what's the probability that the supremum of this process is bigger than some x. Right? This is a closed set 
in the space of continuous functions. Okay, so it will be a measurable set, it will be a Borel set. And the lemma above tells us that this probability is indeed determined uniquely by finite dimensional distributions. Okay, so basically this shows that we should view the Brownian motion or a continuous process as an element in the space of continuous functions instead of the space of all functions so coming with its own Borel sigma algebra and in the case of the Brownian motion the probabilities all the probabilities on that Borel sigma algebra are uniquely determined by our definition in other words by specifying finite dimensional distributions now another useful consequence of continuity is the so-called joint measurability. Let's give a definition of what a measurable or jointly measurable process is. So again here we'll consider the case when our index set is a metric space. So the metric space comes with its own structure, including its own sigma algebra, Borel sigma algebra. And we'll say that a process x t omega, so we view it as a function on the product space of t with omega, this stochastic process is called measurable or jointly measurable. Okay, if it is measurable on the product sigma algebra or with respect to the product sigma algebra as a function on this product space. Okay, where this B is BTD is the Borel sigma algebra on our metric space. And if your process is jointly measurable in this sense, this often can be very useful. So for example, let's say we consider uh, index set T, which is a subset of the real line, like for example, 0, 1. Let's say when T is 0, 1, right? And on 0, 1, you have some, you can put some probability measure. So for example, you can put, you can consider um, a Lebesgue measure on, on 0, 1. And then, when you treat your process as a function of both t and omega, right, you can do some operation with respect to t. For example, you can, you know, let's say, if you can integrate, it, if it's continuous, it will be bounded, so you can integrate it with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And knowing the fact that this x is a measurable function on the product space will automatically imply that once you integrate out one coordinate what is left as a function of omega will be automatically measurable on f right on your probability space okay, so you can see that knowing the joint measurability it can be very useful you can uh, treat a function of t and uh, if you do some operation like an integral the result is again a random variable and so for continuous processes and when our metric space is separable, well, we do have this joint measurability. So our next lemma states that if the metric space is separable and our process xt is sample continuous, then it is jointly measurable. Okay, and the proof of this is just by approximation, that you can write your process X as a limit of processes which are obviously jointly measurable. So, 
for example, you can take any integer n and then using the fact that t is separable, you can split it into a disjoint union of some sets of small diameter. So you can ensure that the diameter of each element in this partition is less than 1 over n. Okay, and then you can pick some point ti in each of these sets and you, you can define the following approximation. You can define the process xn to be x at ti omega whenever t is in bi. Right? So in other words, you kind of replace all indices in this partition element bi by some fixed point ti. Now we know that by continuity these converge uh, for all t and uh, omega. Okay, so by, by sample continuity of our process x we know that x and the w converges to x t omega, not w omega, for all t and omega, right? And so if we can show that xn is jointly measurable on this product space as a limit, x will also be measurable. But xn is obviously measurable because if you consider some level set, level set when xn is less than or equal than c, you are simply um, looking at each element in this partition and for all t in that uh, in, in bi right all these x's are the same you just evaluate them on ti so in other words this will be just a rectangle where you're simply checking that x on ti is less than or equal than c and since this is just a union of rectangles it does belong to the product sigma algebra. Okay, and so that proves that a sample continuous process on when the index set is a separable metric space is a jointly uh, measurable function. So, for example, a Brownian motion that we constructed is a jointly measurable process. Okay, and finally, we conclude this section with, with the definition of a Brownian bridge. Okay, which is simply, let me maybe uh, state informal definition first. So if we have a Brownian motion, then if we consider bt to be this Brownian motion minus t, so minus t times the process Brownian motion at time 1, then we call this process a Brownian bridge. It's a Brownian bridge basically because it starts at 0 but at time 1 it goes to zero. Oh, and by the way, Brownian bridge, here we consider the index t to be only between zero and one. Now, of course, you can now give kind of a formal definition that, that a Brownian bridge is a continuous centered Gaussian process with a specific covariance. And you can calculate from, from this representation that I wrote above that the covariance of this process at, in, at times t and s will be s 1 minus t in the case when s is less than or equal than t. Okay, so you can write formally, if you like, the definition in the same way as we wrote the, the dry definition for the Brownian motion, just change the covariance and restrict the index set to be 
uh, 0, 1. Okay, so that gives the definition. So we constructed um, Brownian motion and Brownian bridge. And in the next two sections, we'll give two classical examples of convergence to these objects on the space of continuous functions on 0, 1 or on, on the half line.